All right, back by popular demand. Uh, I'm going to present a short uh, lecture on blood, blood components, maybe throw in a few other things. All right, so first things first, um, remember the key functions of blood um, compensate for poor diffusion over distance by having uh, blood flowing rapidly. It's called convective flow, pressure-driven flow. Um, Anyway, but the whole point is that we can uh, distribute blood components very quickly to um, all areas of the body, right? So carrying blood gases, uh, nutrients, wastes, all to sites of exchange with the environment. Uh, and, and as well to, uh, to and from uh, sites within the body. In other words, nutrients might be released by the liver to be delivered but to, you know, everywhere, but to, uh, to working muscles. Um, so the, the blood is serving that transportation function. Uh, it also serves as a buffer um, because it has so much protein content both in the plasma and inside the red blood cells. And proteins are uh, generally anions, negatively charged, have, have quite a few negative charges on them, which means they can bind free protons. And that act of binding free protons uh, limits or buffers a pH change. So the protein content helps with uh, pH buffering. Um, also involved with hormone transport. Um, also involved with um, uh, conveying heat from sites of production. Uh, all tissues generate heat, but especially scale the muscles to uh, the skin surface where that heat can be dissipated. So um, quite a few functions in terms of what the blood can carry. Um, don't forget also, and it's one of our key topics, right, uh, hemostasis, the ability of blood to clot and block or inhibit its loss uh, when a blood vessel is broken. And then finally, the fact that it carries around uh, a big portion of the immune system. And again, many immune system cells use the blood as transport, but that's not where they are even typically found or mostly found, certain components. Um, we mentioned that with monocytes. Monocytes are in the bloodstream for a short period and end up then becoming tissue macrophages where they may hang out for um, several months in a tissue, um, sort of waiting for an infection to occur. Okay, so let's talk about um, some of those components uh, more specifically. If we, we did this in class, if we take a sample of blood, take a test tube here, and we take a blood sample, fill it up to about there. If we centrifuge it, um, the formed elements, and the formed elements is just a collective term for all of the cellular or cell-like components. Remember, platelets aren't true cells. Um, but so the cells and the platelets will sink to the bottom upon centrifugation, right? We apply that centrifugal force, and all of the cells are gonna end up down here, and we can put some circles in here to indicate that this is the cellular component. Okay. Then there's this very thin layer. I won't try to draw what's in it, but it's called the buffy coat. And that's actually where, uh, so this is basically where the red blood cells uh, sit or end up upon centrifugations. The buffy coat is where the slightly um, lower density white blood cells and platelets sink to. And then above that is the plasma, right? So this is plasma. And this is the formed elements. Right? Remember, the formed elements include erythrocytes, which I'm going to, instead of spelling that out, I'm just going to use red blood cells. The leukocytes, leuco meaning white, so that's the white blood cells. And then the platelets or thrombocytes. Remember those two terms are synonymous. I'm going to write platelets here. Right? Those all end up in, in this component. Right? Up above we have the plasma and I'll put some dots in here so we remember that many of our all of our dissolved solutes end up in the fluid com uh, compartment or component of blood called plasma. And that would include all of the, the small solutes, include, including the soluble proteins, right? 
And so all of that ends up on top here. Okay. Now, for most people, you end up with, if we sort of look at this picture, we end up with slightly less than half of the volume of blood taken up by the formed elements. And then, of course, that means slightly more than half taken up by the plasma. And so if we measure this, and call that x, and we measure the full height of the blood column here in our tube, we call that y, then hematocrit, abbreviated HCT, equals x over y times 100, right? So in other words, what it is is that it's the fraction of formed elements in whole blood as a percent, right? So if it were half formed elements, your answer here would be, your hematocrit would be 50, right? Now, hematocrit's really important because it is a measure of do you have enough red blood cells? Um, and because red blood cells carry hemoglobin, the oxygen binding pigment within blood um, inside the red blood cells. Uh, it's a measure of whether or not a person has sufficient oxygen carrying capacity in their blood. It can have enough red cells that may not have enough hemoglobin in them. That is another form of anemia, right? Anemia being this sort of condition of not being able to carry enough oxygen in your, in your blood. Um, but generally, um, reduced uh, red cell numbers would indicate anemia and the lack of sufficient oxygen carrying capacity, right? And so hematocrit is this sort of an in, uh, uh, indirect way of measuring your ability to remain aerobic and supply your cells with enough oxygen. Secondarily, hematocrit, and we'll come back to this in the cardiovascular section, hematocrit um, is the primary determinant of blood viscosity, right? Uh, viscosity meaning how thick the blood is. Um, which is an indicator, well, it's a factor that uh, plays into the resistance to moving it through the, the blood vessels. And so thick blood, think of like molasses or honey, something like that, would be very bad, right? That would be far too viscous to move rapidly through the vessels. So we want to minimize our viscosity by keeping hematocrit um, below 50% generally. <clears throat> we talked about the stimulus for... Uh, red blood cell production, I'll come back to that in a second, but it was a hormone called erythropoietin, and that hormone is actually stimulated by hypoxia, right? So it's a hormone produced by the kidney, and it's stimulated by low oxygen levels, which makes sense given that its action is to stimulate the production of red blood cells, which would increase hematocrit, which would increase your oxygen carrying capacity, and oppose the, hemato the hypoxia that initially stimulated its production, okay? So let's talk about a little bit about, before we get to uh, blood cell production, let's talk a little bit about the components here. Um, we'll stay up here for a second. Let's talk about the plasma proteins. Pick one of these and draw an arrow. All right, and they fall into three categories, uh, four categories really, I guess. That is the albumins, the globulins, uh, fibrinogen, and protein hormones. In terms of content, the amount of proteins, albumins are the big one. Right? And albumins, or albumin generally, is, yes, it acts as a carrier protein for, for some molecules, but its big function is likely to provide the blood oncotic pressure. In other words, Proteins are trapped in the bloodstream, right? They can't get out of the capillaries or anywhere else. And they're, only, they're the only solute that that's true for, right? They're the only reflected solute in most capillaries. And because of that, they generate a standing osmotic, we call it oncotic, pressure that would tend to drive bulk flux into the blood, right? Those trapped proteins, uh, if we draw a capillary up here, right? The proteins on the inside, trapped on the inside, provide, remember the, the term is pi C, right? Pi for oncotic pressure, C for in the capillary, and that's a reabsorptive force. So albumin serves that role of, of opposing the filtrative forces, the blood hydrostatic pressure that's pushing out, right? By uh, sort of counterbalancing that with a force pulling water back in. The next group would be the globulins, 
These are largely carrier molecules and the antibodies. The third group I said is fibrinogen. Right? Uh, and that's the one that we talked about with hemostasis. That's the uh, monomer that gets polymerized by thrombin to form fibrin, which uh, forms a mesh to stabilize a blood clot. Okay. The last one would be the protein hormones. Don't even need to write it up here. In terms of content, it's far less than 1%. So um, yes, they're really important in terms of their signaling capabilities, but it's not a big component of the amount of protein. Um, albumins actually constitute probably two thirds of all of the proteins. Okay, uh, if we look down at the form elements quickly, right? we've got our red blood cells and then our white blood cells and platelets up here. Red blood cells, their job is to carry uh, oxygen. They, they produce enormous amounts of hemoglobin, which binds four oxygens each. It's a um, uh, multi-subunit protein. Each sub four subunits binds one oxygen maximally. And so that, that molecule will be binding oxygen at the lungs and then that, ox that blood being carried by hemoglobin will be delivered to the tissues of our body, wherever, brain, muscles, skin, and uh, some of that oxygen will diffuse off to be delivered and then back to the heart and back to the lungs to reoxygenate and round and round it goes over and over. How much oxygen gets delivered of the four that each hemoglobin has carried will be a topic um, to discuss in um, pulmonary physiology. Okay. Red blood cells pretty easy. Now they do aid in, in carbon dioxide carrying too um, by creating an enzyme that helps form the primary carried form of CO2 called bicarbonate. That's not a big, we're gonna come back to that in pulmonary phys, it's not a big point for now. Um, but so think, just think generically, hemoglobin for oxygen also helps with CO2 carrying, you're good with red blood cells, the erythrocytes. White blood cells are much more diverse. Right? We're gonna come back to those when we uh, talk about immunity because we have to talk about each one of them, right? They're gonna form, fall into two broad categories though, right? The innate immune system cells, leukocytes, and the um, acquired immune system cells. Um, they're also leukocytes, but they're specifically lymphocytes, right? The B and T cell lymphocytes are the acquired immune system cells. All the other uh, white blood cells are uh, innate immunity, meaning they are in place and ready to go. They don't need to be stimulated uh, and built up over time, days. Uh, and the last component would be the platelets or the thrombocytes. And again, we talked about them in hemostasis. They have to become activated and then start to stick to each other and then the walls of the vessels and the walls of the vessels to help the initiation of a blood clot. Okay, um, let's go ahead and jump right into hemostasis quickly. We'll do the three steps of, actually, uh, no, let's do um, um, hematopoiesis. Let's do that first. So in hematopoiesis, let me write that up here. Right, that term, hopefully you can see that up there. Yeah, I think so. Uh, hematopoiesis, that's the term for the production of all blood cells. Red, white, platelets, even a few others that we didn't even talk about or said very little about. It starts with, um, a cell, a stem cell called a hemocytoblast. And that's a cell found in red bone marrow in adults. In, in the fetus, it's dispersed a little bit more. Red blood cells are, uh, what blood cells in general are made in a couple different locations, but post birth and post childhood, um, the blood cells are produced in red bone marrow only. Um, and actually even only in, in some red bone marrow after, after a while. Now that stem cell will differentiate to produce two other main stem cells that, are, that sort of fall into specific lineages of cells. And that is the lymphoid stem cell and the myeloid. 
template stem cell is pretty simple because it, it basically produces divides and starts to produce three different lineages, um, which sounds like enough of a challenge. But we've got the B cells, the T cells, and the NK, the natural killer cells. Okay. Only the B and T lymphocytes are acquired immunity. In other words, they, they provide acquired immunity. The NK cells are innate immunity. The, the myelite stem cells produce, squeeze it over here on the side, the, and again, to use the shorter version here, the red blood cells, the other white blood cells, these are white blood cells, right? B, T, and NK are white blood cells. Um, but the other white blood cells, so I'll just put other for now, other WBCs, and that would include the neutrophils, the basophils, the eosinophils, the monocytes, they're all in there. And then the last group would be the platelets. And again, platelets are cell fragments, not full-blown cells. Now, um, we will have to talk more about the individual white blood cells and what they do when we get to, to immunity. Uh, I wanted to throw in one other little bit here, which is the control of this arrow, so I'm going to highlight this arrow, and actually I'm going to highlight this whole pathway from here to here to here, right? That pathway over to red blood cells is erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis, sorry, run that room over here, is the production of red blood cells only. And remember, 99.9% .9 of everything that's produced in this whole picture is this, right? 99.9% .9 of the blood cells formed, including platelets, uh, in terms of mass at least, are the red blood cells, okay? Mass versus numbers, a little bit different calculation there, but doesn't matter. Greater than 99% of the products here are urethro, uh, erythrocytes. The key stimulus, and it's a required stimulus for this, if you don't have it, you will become anemic over time, is EPO. EPO being the short abbreviation for, um, for erythropoietin. So I'm trying to get out of the way for a second so you can see it. Right? So EPO Erythropoietin is the stimulus for erythropoiesis, and it stimulates at a couple different locations here in the pathway, but it increases the red blood cell production, right? You always have some. When does it increase, and when will you get more red blood cells produced? When you become, as I think I said in the intro here, when you become hypoxic. Hopefully that just makes sense. If you're hypoxic, that means right hypoxia, low oxygen. So if you're hypoxic, you want more EPO because EPO will generate more red blood cells and increase your oxygen carrying so that your cells are no longer hypoxic, right? You'll be able to deliver more oxygen and solve that problem, right? Now, why you might be hypoxic can come from a multitude of uh, reasons. You're at high altitude. You have a respiratory, right, higher altitude, there's lower uh, atmospheric pressure, it means there's less oxygen there. Um, respiratory diseases, where you're uh, incapable of taking up enough oxygen. Um, anemias, where you have a reduced number of red blood cells and you're trying to stimulate and to compensate for, you know, uh, an insufficient ability to carry enough oxygen, right? So a multitude of different reasons can get us to this hypoxia, um, but the EPO will help ramp up our red blood cell production to crazy numbers, 10 million a second or more, um, and help solve that uh, hypoxia. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop here and maybe break out and do uh, some other topics in, on blood in uh, subsequent videos.